Cool, cool, cool. All right, guys. So it is now 2.35 in Atlantic Canada. So we'll get started with today's lecture. Um, over the weekend, in the past couple of days, what I've been getting a lot of emails on is what is electronic commerce? And the problem is that's become sort of a ubiquitous term that means the intersection of business, law, and computer science. But the problem is in 2020, um, it's actually more rare for those three things not to intersect than for them to be on their own, which is not the way it was 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, e-commerce sort of meant like eBay, but now it means this broad intellectual area of thought and um, the degree at Dell that was e-commerce has now been changed to digital innovation to combat this. So what I've been able to do for you guys today is um, when I did the e-commerce program, one of the courses was from the business faculty and um, Dr. Colin Conrad, who's a good friend of mine, he was uh, one of the readers on my thesis and he's been a bit of a mentor to me. Um, hello people in the chat saying hello. Um, he lent me his slides for that entire term. So over the next, this lecture and maybe the next one, I'm going to try to cram an entire grad course into uh, one or two lectures so that you guys can have a much better understanding of what e-commerce is in the modern day. The takeaway from today's course should be that anytime that you are using technology to leverage your business or you're using technology to offer a valuable service or in some way exchange currency, that is what e-commerce is. Um, there's an argument for saying e-commerce is anytime the company uses computers because they're paying into uh, investing in technology, which is also true, but for the scope of this course and what we're thinking about, I want you to be thinking about e-commerce as a business strategy where you use your knowledge of computers to make money, offer a service, or sell commodity. So before we get into all of that, let's do some housekeeping announcements. So milestone one, I put on the uh, specification that I expected it to be starting to come in early October. It is now early October. You can submit it whenever you want to, obviously, but just so that those of you who are like me that do work better when there's some semblance of a deadline, I've set the deadline of October 9th. I've not received a single milestone one submission as of yet, so I wouldn't worry too much, but I expect to start seeing them soon. Um, milestone ones will be marked at the TA meeting every Thursday when we're all together. Um, so it probably will be at least about a week or week turnaround time in each one, depending on what time of the week you submit it. And if it gets submitted Wednesday night, it might not be till the next Thursday it gets marked. Uh, I've also been getting a lot of the PGP submissions for participation on the email. Uh, I know I've been very adamant that I only take PDF and screenshots. However, um, in this particular case, a PDF will break your submission. So PDFs, how they work is they add invisible encoding that are still considered characters. And as you can tell from the way PGP messages are exchanged, it is extremely precise down to the case of the character uh, if your message is, maintains its integrity. So I've made it a text only submission. Some of you have tried to email them to me. Uh, please do not do this. The big O on me processing them through email is enormous and it would slow me down and distract me from my ability to help you guys otherwise. And lastly, in terms of housekeeping, the 5% policy has been revised due to concerns for abuse. And I really want you guys to use the TAs um, effectively. So we're just gonna make a quick little change. So I'm a, one of my core philosophies is that if I say I'm gonna do something, I'll do it. So we have to, I've just revised the policy that's conting, contingent with what I've already told you guys is fair, but just so that we make sure the TA's time is used valuably and that your hard earned tuition money is uh, going to the right place. To earn the 5% bonus on a lab, it is up to the exclusive discretion of the lead TA for that deliverable. So that means that in for labs, when it says lead Samita, lead Alex, lead Julia, they're the only ones who can decide if it is worth the 5%. Um, in theory, I could override them, but I am not going to do that unless there is a extreme reason, because uh, I trust the judgment of my TAs, otherwise I wouldn't have hired them. Uh, the bonus is for attending law, law office hours and discussing some aspect of the lab in depth. So I want you to have a meaningful conversation. 
The bonus will only be awarded for email in the rare case that you learn something valuable through the exchange. So that means that like every once in a while, there is an exchange of emails that actually really just makes you feel good and that you've learned something. And I wanna make sure those still get awarded. The TA will have to bring them to my attention and then the, me and the TA will discuss together if we think that's worth the bonus. All right, I'm getting a question in the chat. Our group actually recently prepared the milestone, but I see there's an announcement for Meet the TA's 5%. So if our group have a question, contact the TA. So if you have recently finished your milestone one, what I strongly recommend you do is make members of your group should make appointments with the TAs. Every member of the group does not need to meet with every, um, like you don't, like if there's three of you, the three of you don't all have to meet with three TAs. You're just one representative of your, of your group has to meet with each TA. They will give you feedback on your proposal and then they will mark on Brightspace that, um, it, you can get the 5%. All right, so for today's participation, I need you guys to do your student ratings of instruction. So take the time to do it now. This is one of the only other times that the submission policy um, will change from PDF or PNG. I'm not allowed to ask you for a screenshot of your SRIs because they are confidential and anonymized data. Um, and so I am going to have to trust that you do them and that we do this on the honor system. Um, so we can all take time to do it now, that'd be awesome. But let me explain why they need to be taken seriously. So in these times of pandemic, we are constantly reevaluating our teaching methods. There is a, a faculty meeting every two weeks to discuss what can be done to improve your chat. Have you actually never done this, all right? Okay, I'm right on. Um, I don't even know how to get to it from a student perspective. Um, I think what you have to do, because it's been a while since I've had to do them as a student, is go on Brightspace and look for student ratings of instruction. Can somebody confirm that for me in the chat that that's where you go? There's there's a big button that pops up when you have them pending. Um, and it's like rating some instruction up between copyright and academic support. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, there should have also been an email. Um, the problem is I'm not a Dalhousie student this semester, so I don't know what the interface looks like for you guys. But right now, six of you, which is 9.23% have done it, which I super appreciate. So anyway, um, well, yeah, what sucks? The interface, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what was I saying? So the, no, so the reasons are that we take these seriously is um, for staff reappointments. Um, if ever at any point you've questioned um, if these get read, I will tell you with absolute certainty they do. And Alex Brodsky does more stats on them than you can possibly imagine. Um, the data is heavily analyzed. It has to do with what teachers return in future, in future semesters. So people like me who are new in our academic careers, we only um, are appointed term by term. And if we get if our SRIs come back bad, we don't get rehired. So if you wanna see more of me, um, strong SRIs. The, um, if there's something I'm doing that you don't want me to keep doing, you can let me know and I will change my behavior accordingly. If there's something that I'm doing that you really like and you wanna see in other classes, that will be shared with the rest of the faculty. So there's tons of reasons that it's super beneficial for you to do this. Uh, can I get everyone to let me know when they've found their way or um, are working on it? Hi, I have a, um, an Anna Christians. Sure, go ahead. Uh, our group um, in the group discussion, some uh, some group members say like the we have to finish the next three, and then we can do the milestone. Is that necessary? No, you. Um, it is only recommended that you do lab three. It is not required. Okay. Okay. We got it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So when we designed the labs and milestones, we questioned 
what labs, so how, how the course is supposed to work is lectures influence the labs and the participation points influence the labs, the labs influence the project, and then the project influences how well you do in the real world. And so we recognize that in these difficult times, it's harder for the lecture to influence the lab and the lab to influence the project. So if you want to go out of order because you're interested in something, by all means, but if you find the project intimidating or the mouse, uh, is there anyone who could um, help find where the SRI is? I don't have that interface. Um, like, can anyone like post, is there, is the link anonymized or is it? Um, But anyway, um, if you're intimidated by a milestone, uh, there are la the labs that we can do, our prerequisites are there so that you don't feel as much intimidated. Awesome. Uh, TAs, do you have any announcements for the class while uh, everyone does their SRIs? Alex and Julia, who are our guests today, um, you don't have any questions and no one has any questions for them? Um, no, you still have to, like, because it's anonymized, I can't tell that you did it. So just go on Brightspace. There's a submission folder. It's just text. Put in whatever you want and I'll mark it. <laughs> whatever you want oh. i expect ascii like <laughs> well i mean like it's um it's, it's anonymized research i'm not like it would be an ethics violation to to probe at all i well, put our ta discord and our in the group chat here uh -huh. Has anyone checked out the TA Discord? It's um, a place to bounce around ideas uh, with the TAs to improve your projects and lab success. No, Zoom ruined my aardvark. Oh no. Loki kind of looks scary. <laughs> Loki. It's like a demon creature, like some kind yeah. of weird octopus now. To me, it looks like an elephant from Lord of the Rings. You know, the ones with the big tusks and... Um, yeah. Or Elefante. And yes, Julia, I did watch Lord of the Rings the other day, and that's why this is like the third time I've brought it up. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of like their question. I was just like, you are on a binge. Oh, so is everyone still working on it, just so I know when to go ahead? Good. Just post in the chat when you want me to go ahead, then I'll wait for the consensus. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has any questions for Alex or Julia, this is a fantastic time to ask them. Okay, I'll give another minute or so, and then we can get started. It looks like everyone's just finishing up. Okay. If you're still working on yours, feel free to keep working on it or feel free to work on it later. But it looks like people are finishing up, so uh, get on with the show. All right. So what is e-commerce? You need to design, develop, and deploy an e-commerce site to finish this course. The term e-commerce is fairly ambiguous and can refer to many aspects of CS. It uses a buzzword at times. The term has evolved over the years. So it can refer to an online marketplace, but also anytime a business and computer science interact. Um, I often like to include law in, in interaction as well. Um, and so I recently, having finished this degree, 
I was able to get a semester's worth of slides from the business issues course. So we're going to try to get through those as many as we can today. Um, I just want to thank Colin Conrad for these slides. He's an assistant professor over in the Faculty of Management. He did his PhD um, when I was doing my undergrad. I don't remember when he graduated. It was right when I started my master's. And uh, he also did a master of electronic commerce, just like me, and did an MA in philosophy at Queens. He's been a mentor of mine, and he was nice enough to share these slides. Uh, he's based these slides off of uh, reimagining work in the age of AI and Lawton and Travers e-commerce 2018. This is a fantastic resource if ever you're uh, at the library and want to learn more. Okay. So the first thing we have to think about when we think about e-commerce is the fourth industrial revolution. So in the past, we've looked at it, we're able to move water and machines and steam to create simple, simple processes, and then it broke into the mass assembly line. And then after that, it turned into computers replacing workers. But now we're working on cyber physical systems that can take place all over the world simultaneously and do things like virtualization, which can run programs or processes from multiple continents and places in the world simultaneously to work on the same project. And so this is reimagining work. And therefore, when work is reimagined, it's reimagining business goals and needs for privacy, security, finance, the whole gamut, right? So I'm sure you're all familiar with websites like Shopify where Shopify comes in, they're incredibly useful because their business model is they take on risk in exchange for a slice of your transactions. So they come into your site and they say, you wanna sell things on your site, phenomenal, we have the software to do it, we can put a store right in right away, we can take credit card payments, we can take PayPal, we can do it all, and all you have to do is give us a slice of each transaction. And this is an incredibly good offer because not only is Shopify worked on by giant IT departments and giant infosec departments that are able to audit frequently for security, they take on the risk of payment um, breaches. So if you're working with Shopify and they have a data breach, that might negatively affect you, but you're not on the hook for any of the finances that could have gone awry because they took on that risk. But the, the, the exchange for this is that every time you sell anything, a percentage goes back to Shopify. And that is their e-commerce business model is they've come, up, come in and taken that risk. So we see other businesses as well. Uh, if you're familiar with Salesforce, Salesforce. Alex, are you drawing a cat now in the chat? Uh, that's a dog, thanks, anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, very appreciated. So um, we have websites like Salesforce that come in and can manage business logic and I just, what is it, what is that big thing? Um, not only do they manage the business logic, but they come in and they ch completely change the way your internal processes work. And that way, and again, they just take a slice of your business. So they're an incredibly powerful tool for managing your assets. Um, Okay, so these slides, as I've said, were from an entire um, entire course. So a couple of times, it might seem a little weird for me to phrase it this way, but this is obviously from the intro week. So the top 10 things that Colin thinks you're going to learn about e-commerce are as follows, uh, B2C business models. So in e-commerce, we often look at B2C, B and B2B. So B2C is business to consumer. That's when a product is sold directly to an end user. So that's things like Netflix. Um, and then B2B is things like Salesforce and Shopify, which is business to business. So we look at different models of e-commerce, usually within these two thresholds. Um, they're C to C technically also exists, but I've never really heard it come out. Um, business to clients. Business to client is understandable, but technically another business can also be a client. So business to consumer is better, but don't worry about that too much. You get the concept. Um, ooh, good point. Um, Kijiji might actually be C to C. Um, actually. 
it, it does have elements of C to C, you're right. So consumer to consumer. But then again, Kijiji still takes a huge advertising cut by you putting your stuff up there and them advertising um, on your ads, essentially, right? Yeah, and also you can like pay to promote your stuff, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And you can only post it a certain amount of times if you're not a premium member. So it's kind of like, it is exactly. still business to consumer. Yeah, it seems like C to C, but the fact of the matter is if it's free, you're the product. So Alex is exactly right. Um, all right, so latest business trends like electronic commerce that we used to talk about bricks plus clicks as the dominant model like Walmart. Now we're seeing e-commerce infiltrate retail, even to the point where retail is becoming a subcategory of e-commerce. So we start seeing things like software and service and instant supply chains. So this becomes more like, um, we used to think of big box companies as being the way to go, but then we get things like Best Buy that aren't as popular as they used to be because instead of going to a big box, you can just go to Amazon. Um, let's skip that one. Then we can also start talking about things like um, cryptocurrency. And for a while, the term e-commerce typically referred to cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and the like. Um, I actually know a guy who's made over $50,000 in Bitcoin. If you guys are interested, I could ask him to come in and do a guest lecture. Um, actually, this is the first time I've thought on this. Would Etsy or similar sites not infer the seller is running a small business and should be paying taxes on that? Uh, there's actually huge lawsuits about that all the time. So it's basically like the main idea is that, yes, they are actually a small business mm -hmm. and would have to pay most small business taxes. Right. Alex, you're on the ball today. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I have a really good friend from camp. His name's Kevin. Um, him and I have tried a couple small businesses together, including some with Bitcoin, but we... We're both to Steve Wozniak. You know, we care too much about the technology that we forget to make money. Um, but uh, he's been involved in Bitcoin since like the beginning. And um, how he figured out how to mine Bitcoin was he got a dorm room in Ryerson and um, mined Bitcoin out of his dorm room and didn't have to pay electrical costs. So he just took all the profit. And normally the biggest um, profit killer on mining Bitcoin was the electrical costs and Ryerson never bothered him about it. So uh, it worked out for him, but yeah, no, I can ask him if he wants to come in. Um, he's got an electrical engineering degree and he's working, I think at AMD right now, working on, um, building GPUs. He's quite intelligent with hardware. Uh, every time him and I get together, we sometimes get into arguments about the way things work and realize I'm using software terms and he's using hardware terms but I will see if he wants to come in. Uh, just live somewhere that your GPU becomes a heat source for your freezing living room. Not a bad idea. Okay, so Tableau for data visualization. So if you're, um, a, a Tableau is extremely interesting piece of software. It is um, free to students, I believe, and it's very good at data visualization. So it's in e-commerce, data is typically readily accessible because you can, pretty well track everything that your clients do. So this is kind of the starting place for if you're really interested in uh, data analytics and machine learning, which are huge parts of e-commerce, because if you're offering a free product and that makes your client, the, if you're offering a free service that makes your users the product and how you make money on that product is through selling your data. Um, how to launch a startup in Halifax. I'm gonna skip this one. You can ask Colin Conrad directly if you want more information on that. Um, machine learning for Python is another tool I recommend you guys check out. Uh, same thing as mining from before. Uh, we're gonna talk about how AI is changing business processes, um, strategies for working with AI and competencies in ET scale. But I'm gonna skip some of this because it's not all relevant to you guys. But one of my favorite terms in e-commerce is Uberization. Uh, did that just say that si uh, data science jobs start shy of six figures? Probably. I don't know where you saw that. But that seems right. Sorry. No, that's correct. Um, uh, 
Uh, actual question here in regards to AI, one of my managers at Trend Micah was inferring within our careers AI, well, that is true. Um, AI is replacing most work and the funniest part is we're just, you know, we're programming AI to replace some of the coding jobs because of how frameworky everything's getting. It's easier to do, but there's always going to be a need for some coders. Like there are some problems that are just uncomputable at the moment. So you need coders. Um, it just depends on the quality of coder you are, because if you just know a couple languages and you don't know the theory behind how things work, um, then you're more likely to be replaced. But if you understand the theory of software development, how to improve language and how things work, um, your job is quite safe. So one of my favorite things in e-commerce is to talk about a term called disruptive innovation. So to me, disruptive innovation is, you guys in the chat are ridiculous. Um, Disruptive innovation is basically the word for, hey, that's cheating. I don't like that, but that's perfectly legal. Uh, so Uber comes in and takes away the taxi jobs and disrupts the industry. And it's illegal, but people are still putting up with it and, and they're starting to favor it. So it's disruptive innovation because it's, it's bringing in new trends and new ideas. And it's using technology to make money in a way that wasn't possible before but it's angering the last generation, it's angering the workers. Um, so for example, in Ottawa, um, I, I used to be pro-taxi, but then, um, actually Uber's coming to LFX, by the way. And there was one time I was on the airport parkway. So in Ottawa, there's pretty well, the Ottawa airport, there's one way in, one way out. It's called the airport parkway. And um, I was on it going out to pick my grandma from the airport. And the traffic was just like dead stop, like five kilometers per hour. But the traffic in the other direction was moving fine. And the weather was fine. There was nothing else going on. And at one point, the traffic just sped up to the 80 kilometers per hour it's supposed to be at. And there was some, some taxi driver had decided to punish the city of Ottawa for adopting Uber. He was just getting on the airport parkway and driving five kilometers per hour in protest. And then at the airport parkway, the, there was lots of taxi drivers making lots of noise and disrupting traffic. And Ottawa's mayor, Jim Watson, got up and said, until they stop acting like this, we're going to allow Uber. And they got even more mad, as you can probably imagine. And so there was this piece of e-commerce that came in and changed the way they did things. But the pushing point wasn't the improvement of service it was the reaction of the older industry so that disruptive innovation piece is actually quite interesting because if your industry adapts to the new technology it's much less disruptive than one it's fighting because personally if i was a taxi driver i'd probably just be like okay i drive for uber now they make more money anyway um but because they have so much investment um in their taxi license, it's harder for them to turn a profit and there's more regulation. So it's also harder for them to get out. I don't know if they've turned a profit or not. I would assume they have, but. Um. So each year there's a company called Gartner that releases a hype scale describing their analysis of technology trends. So we see things that go up in terms of their expectations, then they make an immediate drop down when people realize that the technology that was promised is 10 years away and that it's only a uh, research idea or it's still it's still coming still coming through but we see here there's the innovation trigger so we have things like quantum computing that are just being hyped um, uh, they're being hyped quite a lot but then we see as things um, after they hit their peak they go through the trough of disillusionment, which is, hey, wait a minute, this was a cool idea, but we don't know. Um, I don't know what smart justice either. Um, uh, this is this was a cool idea, but wait, there's nothing we can do with this yet. But all of a sudden, all these researchers get together and go, wait a minute, now we can, and so it's on its way. So, for example, virtual reality five years ago, I would have told you was a dead end, and it's turning into be quite something useful. Um, where meanwhile, things like autonomous vehicles, which we've been promised for ages, are still 10 years away. I don't know what 4G printing is meant to be. I 
it's printing through time. I don't know. So we've talked about types of e-commerce. So don't forget, we talked about consumer to consumer, um, mobile commerce. So we can look at things like monetizing cellular devices so that can turn into like premium games, uh, social e-commerce, um, um, social e-commerce, like um, social networks, uh, selling data, that kind of thing. And then local e-commerce, which is, um, Jared, you live in Arm Prior, right? You guys over there have a food delivery app called Valley Eats. It is a version of Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes that only exists in the Ottawa Valley, which is this small part of um, a small part of Ontario that is basically just a county. But whenever I'm over there, I always see signs at McDonald's that say, we deliver through Valley Eats. And um, that would be like a local e-commerce, despite the fact that it's leveraging the power of the internet. It's looking at the fact that it's not really beneficial for Uber Eats to come to that small area. So they've taken the idea and cloned it to a local system. So we look at the different types of e-commerce. Well, uh, business to business obviously makes the most, $6.3 trillion, which you can expect because businesses, um, Oh man, my brain is weird today. Because businesses are willing to pay way more money for premium services than we are. So for example, business licenses to some software costs upwards of $10,000, which is something that I would never pay for software, no matter how good it is, but an accounting department would just write a check and be done with it. Um, business to consumer, um, nowhere near as big, only about 10%. Um, but still 5.3 billion, five, $531 billion is nothing to shake a stick at. Oh wow, so you couldn't, uh, so couldn't a small uh, business act for small cities, but I wouldn't be much worth it for a larger company. So think about all the small companies that are, so the question is like, why wouldn't a big company go into a small, a small city and take over? Well, think about how many small cities there are, right? Like, in Halifax, we have the HRM. You go up to Truro, then you go to Amherst, and um, what's the what's the one uh, Antigonish? Like, there's there's all these other small cities. Like, think about the amount of effort it would take to deploy uh, these small cities when you already have a lot of revenue coming from your large cities. The um, cost benefit analysis wouldn't be worth it. And a company like Valley Eats works because they're able to stay local and be part of the community. As soon as it starts becoming a big chain, it's harder to maintain. And you can't know really more than one or two small communities. Um, so Valley Eats is in that area, but like if they were to expand to let's say Truro, they wouldn't know the customers, they wouldn't know the businesses, then they'd be working on a much smaller scale, they'd be much larger scale, there'd be travel expenses, uh, they'd be worrying about employees in another area, they might have to have a second office, um, all these things that could be avoided if there's just one little office in one small part of Ontario where competition isn't too likely. So the second you start expanding, the second you start worrying about competition, because uh, the advantage of being value eats is that nobody wants to bother competing with them. All right, business to business, uh, e-commerce describes e-commerce business models that attempt to connect with individual consumers. So retail goods, travel services, uh, content, what is the difference between a good and a service? So a good is a commodity, it's a physical thing, it's an object that exists in the world. Service is something that is provided by a human being with a skill that is a human that has invested money in learning that skill. So all of you provide computer science as a skill whenever you're hired to be in, an in, in any environment. Um, but a computer itself would be a good. All right. So retail growth in the USA, Lawton and Traver described B2C e-commerce growth in the United States as exponential growth trend. If we just look at retail, citing the same source, we see a very slight exponential trend. So every year we see an increase in the amount of retail e-commerce sales. Uh, there are many similarities between the U.S. and Canada, but e-commerce trends is not one of them. This has to do a lot with competition that exists, um, as well as what, how do I put it? 
Canada and the US just have very different corporate structures and it's hard to compare the two. So for example, we actually get in Canada a lot of banking technologies before the United States does. So the last time I was in the US, um, I went to a Chick-fil-A, which I was told is supposed to be this amazing restaurant, but it's actually more of a salt factory. And um, I tapped my visa and they were like, are you, what did you just do? It approved. And I was like, yeah, I tapped my card. And she was like, oh, I thought you like hit the machine in some special way. Like, a, like, like the person working actually thought that I could hit the point of sale machine like a vending machine in a certain way that it would activate the approved signal. Um, and I actually, like, personally, I couldn't believe that level of naivety, but at the same time, I was like, hey, if they haven't seen the technology before, I mean, that might be what's gone through my head too. Um, so, and the reason we get that technology first is because we only have five major banks. The US has so many major banks that it's so hard for there to be any innovation at all. Because if they go, if one bank goes and adopts chip technology or tap technology, and the other banks don't follow suit, then they have like the bank that adopts it has to pay for the old system too, and has to wait for every business to update their point of sale machines. But when five banks get together and say this is improved security, let's all invest in it, all of the point of sale machines approve at a more consistent rate. Okay. So consumer to consumer e-commerce involves models that enable consumers to sell to each other. So we were right with the Kijiji uh, example. Uh, we also get Uber, Airbnb, and Etsy that have made gains in the space, but Alex is right that there are B2C elements of those as well. And there are also major tax implications. Uh, those of you in BACS, when I took, if you've taken uh, Management 3511, if they're still making you read this paper, there's um, I might be able to get access to it. If not, there's a paper from Harvard about like people going into Airbnbs and just trashing them and the legal ramifications that come from uh, people doing that. It's actually a very interesting take because the law isn't prepared to deal with short-term rentals. Um, yeah, Hulu is, is pretty nice. That is something I, the US has above us. Uh, thank you in the chat. Okay, uh, let's skip this. I've talked about Facebook and privacy a lot. So Lobden and Traver identify eight elements of business models. So value proposition, revenue model, market opportunity, competitive environment, competitive advantage, market strategy, organizational development and management team. You guys do not need to know these terms. It is just more of an idea of how e-commerce functions. All right, so first question, why do we think users equals success? Typically, venture capitalist firms look at revenue growth, not profit, as primary measure of success. Why? If a company is turning profit, it is not maximizing growth. In the case of social media, it is widely believed that the firm value is in the users themselves. Users are marketing opportunities. So we can think of it like this, right? If you're turning a profit, that means everything is working the way it's supposed to, but you're not reinvesting. What, what is going on in the chat? I'm sorry, I've completely distracted the entire class with food. It's okay. my fault. That's no problem. We, we like to have fun here, it's okay. Um, so anyway, with, when you're with your with social media value proposition, a more users equal success, but in businesses, revenue growth and not profit is looked at the primary measure of success. I don't know enough about business to explain to you the math why that is, but I will tell you that if you're turning a profit, you're limiting your business growth because you're taking that profit and running away with it and not running it back into the business. So we look at types of, uh, of business to consumer, uh, types of business to consumer business models. That's a lot of business, I wanna go. So e-tailers, community providers, content providers, portals, transaction brokers, market creators, and service providers. So an e-tailer is something you would see before like Amazon JD. Um, this is similar to a, tra a traditional brick and mortar star, but with the internet, you just go in, you buy what you're looking for. Um, it's kind of like the internet version of big box. Uh, community providers create an online environment where people with similar interests can interact. So we see things like LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, so Facebook marketplace. So people who live in the same geographic location can work, can 
build a community of business together where the owner of the platform profits from this. So Facebook Marketplace and LinkedIn are examples. Um, then there's, depending on how the company is structured, there's different ways to make money. So there's premium re re revenue models as well as marketing. Content providers. So these are ones that create content that is hard to create and copyright the content and sell it. So we see things like Netflix, Google Music, um, iStore, any, any form of streaming. Um, subscription slash repeat revenue from user base versus one-time purchasing. If all users pay X amount a month, that's the easiest way to increase revenue if it increases users. Um, math, the math holds on that, uh, but I, increasing users can increase costs, but I would think that the easiest way will almost always be an advertisement model. Um, because with an advertisement model, you can always make money off your users as long as they're not blocking your ads. Um, you have to convince people that your thing is worth enough um, to do the subscription. But if you're like Google and you've got trackers and cookies on your people's browsers and you can track them on every site they visit, it doesn't matter who they subscribe to or how long they're there, that profile just gets worth more money every single day. And because of that, um, you can't, it's impossible to make unblockable ads. Uh, the close, I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, and what was I? Oh yeah, with the advertisement models, um, you can just track, tracking people and building the profile. It's just the easiest way to do it and the user doesn't even know what's happening. Um, ads are unblockable. They're like radar. So in the old days, cops would monitor your speed on the road with radar. With radar. So people would get radar detectors. Now cops in their car have radar detector detectors. So the black market started selling radar detector detector detectors. And so now cops have to use radar detector 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 detectors. And I think there's even another round of that. So ad blocking, right now there's ad block plugins and there are ad block detectors and there are ad block detector blockers. Um, and some of the ways sites work, these can brick the site, but no matter what people do, there will always be a way around it. The closest you can get to unblockable ads with current technology is stitching, um, stitching video into your content. So for example, if you have a video you're showing or like a TV show and, um, you stitch the ads to be part of the show and you don't allow a fast forward. That's the closest we can get, but people have shown very quickly that that is not something they're down, that they're gonna put up with. Um, well, the, the problem with ad blocking is um, the monetary, the monetization of it is almost like holding the internet hostage. Because what ad block tries to do as a philosophy is they, is they say, we only block intrusive ads. We don't block ads that are unintrusive and we're trying to set a standard. And truthfully, it's not unintrusive ads that they block, that they allow. It's companies who've paid to be whitelisted. So if you want your ads to be seen by people with ad block, you can pay ad block to have your ads whitelisted, but people can still choose without any cost to them to also block unintrusive ads. So I find that that model is kind of dangerous because it's kind of like, it, it's kind of like paying someone like not to tell on you or something like that, right? Like they can still do it. There's no assurance. Um, personally, I think that I have no problem with advertising so long as it's unintrusive. Um, I hate anything that ruins my experience or changes what I'm trying to do or gets in the way. So for example, if I'm watching a show and there's an ad, I won't watch it. And my friends always ask me like, why don't I like sports? They always say like, because of the way I talk about like anime characters and like book characters and everything else, like I would love the story of like some guy from small part of Nova Scotia becoming like the captain of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Like I'm supposed to like, like I would love that story, but I can't sit through sports because there's ads and it drives me crazy. Um, oh, dude, I always I only watch football the day after, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and you just like, there's no ads and it's like an hour instead of four. That's amazing. Exactly. There's so much ads and I can't even take it. And like, I love the story of sports, but I just can't. Ugh. And, but like on other sites, when there's just like ad supported links on Google, I have no problem clicking those because that's the way the sites make money. It's just, I don't want to spend time paying for something if I've already paid for um, a service. So for example, in the old days of TV, when you had like a satellite or cable box and there was still commercials, that drove me crazy because my parents would always talk about how they're paying $200 a month for cable and you know it should be better. And I'm like, why are there ads if we're paying $200 a month? And the answer is because with cable, you are paying for the infrastructure for Bell or Rogers or East Link or whoever to connect your home to the TV station. And none of that money goes to the TV station. The TV station has to generate all of its money through ad revenue. And I don't think that's fair. So I would much rather pay for a service up front and enjoy the service ad free. And that's why I happily pay for Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus because they take my money. I get to watch a show in peace. Everybody wins. But there are different models and there's huge debate on this. So um, in terms of ads though, sports are what's keeping intrusive ads alive and TV advertising alive. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next five, 10 years when those things transition to streaming as well. Uh, Portals offer a method for working with the web. So these are things like search engines. Um, We have, there are websites like DuckDuckGo, which advertise, but they don't do it based on your data. And the hope is to attract people that are more interested in privacy, but are still going to allow unintrusive ads like many of you in the chat. Have any of you used DuckDuckGo before? Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. What it does is it pulls its data from other search engines as well, so that um, you get really awesome results. And that way Google just thinks that there's this one IP address that asks tons and tons of questions. And it is standard on the Tor browser, you guys are correct. And so transaction brokers, uh, these are things like Expedia. Um, So what they do is they say, hey, there's thousands and thousands of tourist places out there and there's only so much time in the day. We will allow you to search all of them at once, but we get a cut of whatever sales are processed. So see other things like Skyscanner, uh, lots of travel things. Anytime there's there's like thousands of local businesses and one dominant competitor, you can come in and create a transaction brokerage service that just unites all of these smaller businesses and all you're doing is being a search index for them and taking a cut for people who found you that way. Market creators build the digital environment, buyers can sell, meet, display, and search for products. So we see eBay, but also Uber, Airbnb, TaskRabbit also fall into this category. So this is where you can kind of create your own, your own store, your own revenue, put it online. Um, and this slide deck is completely filled with buzzwords, Chad. So there's, there's lots more coming, I promise you. Um, but the, you know, the point of the buzzwords is to build the concepts in your head. I don't use these buzzwords day to day and I don't know anyone who does. Um, but with things like eBay and similar sources, what you can do is you can create your own brand on a platform that people already know. So like, there's been a few times on eBay where I've ordered something and it's not been quite right. And the people have said to me, well, do whatever you want to fix it. It's okay. It's okay. Just give us the five stars. Like that's all we need is the five star feedback. And that's because they're building that brand. They've got this local brand to them. That doesn't mean anything to most people in the world. When people look at the brand, they can assess it based on a scale that they already know and are comfortable with based on the eBay brand. And from there, they can make a lot of money doing whatever it is they do in that marketplace, so long as people can come in and verify its credibility based on scales they already know. Service providers, so these are things like um, eTailer. So for example, those of you out there that are like me and are built physically in ways that no pair of jeans in any retail store um, will ever fit you properly, um, so at one point I went into a, um, 
a suit store and I was wearing like just like a pair of jeans and they looked at me like what are you doing here and I was like I want my measurements taken and they took all my measurements and I was like see ya and I went on to I think it's called I Taylor not you Taylor but um and I ordered the absolute most perfect pair of jeans I've ever had I was able to customize it down to every last little bit bit on the stitching on the waist size on the ankle size and on the length and um shut that up that's not a thing it is a thing um i will show What's called I, I want to link like right now like <laughs> i'm interrupting this lecture okay you, you do you Um, where's the custom jeans? So first thing you do is you pick what denim you want. Um, I typically like to go for either a lighter blue, like something like this, and then everyone knows like, that nerds wear light blue. Oh uh, well, you need a black gray denim. Fine, go with this one. And then what do you want, like a tapered fit? Or like a boot no, cut? No, boot cut. A boot cut, okay. So then we go next. And then you can pick on whatever. <laughs> what is this? That's some advice feet. by Alex. <laughs> um, and you can pick whatever, like, you want, if you want some paint on them, I don't know why you would, but if you do, um, then you get to pick, <laughs> you want a button fly or a zip fly? Then you get to pick your style of pocket. Um, then you get to pick your style of coin pocket. And this is where I learned it's called the coin pocket. I always just called it the weird, <laughs> the weird <laughs> it's, coin it's, pocket. That's... Uh, then you pick your like, you know, back pocket style. I don't know, I'm not actually doing this too seriously. Oh, God, and then no. <laughs> you pick your stitching style. If you want to know bright orange or something, then you can pick your pocket lining, your monogram. You can be like, uh, oh God. Back. Hacker man. Um, this is getting worse by the second. <laughs> metal beads. I don't know. Then you go to the fitting room and you put in your standards. They send it to you in six weeks. So there you go. That is I am going to make the trashiest pair of jeans. Oh, that is e I expect of- you to show it to us at lecture one day. Uh, can we can we not model the jeans in lecture? I, I didn't think I'd have to say that, but. Um, Okay. Well, actually, you know what? If, if the, were those jeans 129? They were, but they're the most comfortable. Um, pair I mean, of who jeans pays less had. than $200 for jeans? Well, typically, what I did before this was I went to Value Village, bought um, whatever their big and tall jeans were, then had them custom tailored. And that usually, I uh, feel like we're going to need to order, need a botnet to order a bunch of <laughs> Okay. So, the retail apocalypse. So with all of these emerging business styles, companies like Sears have completely gone into business, which if you told, if you went in a time, if you got in your DeLorean, hopped into 88 miles per hour and went back to 1970, and you said that in the 2010s that Sears would just, no one would have believed you. Back in the 60s and 70s, people just went to Sears for everything. Um, my grandma actually swore by Sears and like, she wouldn't there's certain like appliances she would only buy from Sears and if they weren't made by Sears she'd be like um I'm not going back like she was that dependent on the brand but they were not able to keep up with e-commerce they did not adapt their business model at all and now Sears no longer exists um it is a complete um it was a complete destruction of their company they went from being one of the complete giants to nothing All right, Sears Canada is in a difficult situation, though one of Canada's largest retailers. It has been three consecutive years of losses. I'm pretty sure if it's still, um, I'm pretty sure they're bankrupt now because these slides are from two years ago. If it still exists, they are on their way to bankruptcy. Uh, so famous Canadian retailer, which uh, there's a company called Eaton's with a famous Canadian retailer, which went bankrupt in 05. And Sears Canada buy, bought them. At the time, there was a play by play to Lampert acquire 100% of Sears Canada, which ultimately failed. And they were both catalog retailers. So back in the day, you didn't go on Amazon or eBay or whatever and look at the products. A catalog would come in the mail 
and you and maybe your partner or your family would sit and go through the catalog and go, that looks cool, I want that. And then circle it, and then you either fill out a form and order it, or you can go to the store and try to find it. And obviously they don't do that anymore. Uh, there's also competition with Walmart, where Walmart, um, Walmart has adapted to e-commerce better because they've got a storefront that people use. Uh, it's still not perfect. Where Walmart is genius though, and I mean genius, is in their store design. It is ridiculous. Okay, so here's what Walmart does. When you go to any Walmart, the location of most items is data mined to be the precise best location for that area's demographics. So if you go to the McDonald's on Mumford, it says things like back to campus. But if you go to the one out in Bears Lake, it says things like back to school. And obviously that's, that's not too much of a difference. But the stores are arranged based on the needs of that demographic. The only thing that they do consistently across all stores is they keep the electronics department in the back because that's the longest that's the longest walk from any area to the door. And that's also where they keep the most expensive stuff. So it's their best chance of catching shoplifters. But like, if you go to an area that is lower income, you might find that Walmart has um, cheaper clothes at the front of the store. You might find that they have um, cheaper food, like snacks near that area. But if you go to a higher income store, higher income neighborhood you might find that the sporting goods are near the front of the store like the camping area is near the front of the store or um or that kind of thing they have absolutely phenomenal floor plans designed based on data mining and that's where they succeed in uh, e-commerce is instead of changing their business model they went and used the data they had which was developed through research and e-commerce and used it to empower their already existing brick and mortar mo uh, model. So then we have things like Target Canada as well. Target's no discount retailer. However, in Canada, they not nearly as well known and not nearly as popular. Um, e-commerce in Canada is 2017 it was e-commerce was 7.2% of total retail sales. 50% of Can Canadians made an e-commerce purchase online once per month. 70% uh, to the U.S. E-commerce in Canada is expected to reach 56 billion by 2020, up from 29 billion in 2015. I'd have to check if those numbers have held up in the last two years. Uh, Sears Canada's strategy since 2005 has been to expand current locations and until recently towards new ones, but I don't think that worked out for them in the last two years. Uh, E-commerce is growing at 15% per year, where standard retails are at 2%. Customer demographics, e-commerce growth favors younger demographics, which makes sense. Um, older people aren't adopting e-commerce technology. They're, they're staying with what works. So in my neighborhood, for example, there's, a, there's two stores right next to each other. One's called the Record Center and one's called the Audiovisual Center. And my dad and I have been going to these stores. They used to be one store. Now they've been expanded to two since I was like three or four years old. And they sell vinyl records, CDs, they used to sell VHS, and now they're moving into Blu-ray. And if you go over there and you try to preach the gospel of streaming, you will get laughed out of that place. And I know because it's happened to me many, many times because I, I just can't help myself. So I go in there and I talk about how Blockbusters failed, HMVs failed, but this guy's raking in thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars selling DVDs and vinyl records. And you might be thinking like, how does he do that? It's because he's got a local community of middle-aged men, um, 50 to 70 years old, so also on the senior scale, that have decided that they refuse to learn a new technology. So everyone in there will talk about how they have collected over 4,000 DVDs since DVDs started being a thing and that they have no interest in upgrading to Blu-ray or that they've started collecting Blu-ray and that's gonna be the last one. And they talk about how they finally have a remote control that makes sense to them or like they have their setup just right. And I'll say something like, well, what about streaming? And they'll look at me and say, you can't stream everything. And to which my response is, of course you can. It just depends if you pirate it or not. 
and th to them they doesn't even register if it's not on netflix or it's not on crave or whatever it is they have no interest in finding it and they don't know that you can find it any other way and um these people they go and they buy movies almost every day so my dad's retired i think he's 66 or 67 and he's got a routine um, and part of his routine is going to this store seeing everyone there and saying hi picking out a movie movies are pretty cheap they're usually like five to ten bucks if he likes the movie he keeps it if he doesn't he brings it back and doesn't even like he could sell it to them but he, he just gives it back to them and um that's how they so they get their inventory is they a lot of people sell them back their stuff and occasionally he gets fed up with his movie collection puts it all in a box brings it back to the store and starts over and there's lots of people that do this these are people that are refusing to adapt to new technology and they are keeping thriving business markets alive that don't have much time left but as long as they are alive and able to go and spend their own money this is how they're going to do it so they are not going to adopt e-commerce and the only business models that can support it are local community models that don't have to pay large salaries to accountants and ceos and multiple rental fees and have lots lots of locations instead it's just one guy with a store that has a loyal cult following of people that are refusing to learn a new technology so keep that in mind when you think about e-commerce because um, this is not a localized trend to suburban Ottawa. This is a worldwide thing. When people just get to a certain age, they know how things work for them and they're okay with it. Uh, like my grandfather was super into genealogy and we used to always say to him before he passed away, um, why don't you use a computer to look up genealogy? And he would say, well, what's a computer going to be able to do for me in terms of genealogy that I can't do at the library? And this was back in the 90s and he had no idea what technology was going to be able to do for him now if he could see what ancestry could do and blow him away but like even when the technology started to grow and we started to say like no no it's out there he was like if it's out there i'll find it doing it my way and that's the end of it yeah, moving on from demographics uh leadership we also know that it is hard to lead the way over for the exact reason i just described usually people who are in leadership positions typically have worked long enough in their career to um, be the age where they reject new technology and sometimes it is hard for them to accept the way of the world and therefore they don't know how to lead their business. All right, so I'm gonna skip over these, but I, le I left these in here for you to study on your own time if you're interested. These are just different strategies for e-commerce design, so I'll quickly glance at them. Um, you can look at strategic startups and strategic advantage. So industry-wide and unique, we see things like Costco, Canadian Tire. Uh, they sell absolutely everything and they have a unique brand where then there's a low cost, the low cost alternative, which is Walmart and Amazon, which also sell everything. But Costco, it sells things in unique packaging and a unique service where you get things in bulk. And then you get things like Best Buy that sell absolutely everything in a particular area, like technology or Foot Locker that sells shoes. Okay, back to e-commerce. So many of the principal strategic tools discussed can also be applied to e-commerce retail. So we have e-commerce operations. Strict e-commerce companies do not require a storefront. Um, how do you source the actual development of web assets? Well, you have to come and get people like us to come in and build your systems. And we're not always gonna be able to build exactly what you wanna build. And there's gonna be technology limitations. And then of course, how do you pay us before we've actually built it? And then once you have something built, how do you get your customers? How do you get your users? And how do you compete with organizations like Amazon that have found a way to sell everything and the whole web knows them? How will the traditional business model survive when our generations become older? We're accustomed to upgrading. Um, how, so the, um, that is a very, Mahmoud, you've asked a very insightful question. Um, we don't know the answer to that right now. It's only a wait and see. But traditionally, the classic answer is 
our ways of doing things now are going to become more ubiquitous and what's not going to challenge our way it's not the old ways that are going to challenge what we think now it's going to be the next generation that comes in and tells us that we're doing things wrong because they found a better way that i can't even begin to imagine um same and jared you're quite your thing about learning new video games so i am um, I have a hacked Wii that has, I think, 300 GameCube Wii games and the entire virtual console library that was ever um, available. And ha hacking Nintendo Wii's has a very strong online community. And Nintendo has done absolutely nothing about this. There's absolutely nothing they can do. But one of the reasons is that the old Wii games, the old N64, SNES, um, NES, all those games have long been paid off and Nintendo is not offering a platform to sell them. So all of this hacking of the Nintendo Wii is not taking away um, from any of their revenue. But I do know like a, there's two, there's a used game store in Ottawa that sells amazing, has an amazing selection of old games. And um, I'm always in there buying stuff to copy onto my Wii and me and my collector friends are always in there. And um, they're the ones who stand to lose from pirating because they now have the market share on old games but they are because they have the they're the only place in ottawa that sells these old games they're not too worried about it either because someone's got to come in from them to buy the game so they can copy it onto the wii uh, they're able to sell games that once sold for sixty dollars for two hundred dollars um, and things of that nature so there is a lot of change um, that's happening in terms of um, in terms of the different models, but the old models are still useful. And it's just funny to me that in, a, in an industry that now is selling video games almost exclusively online through things like PSN, uh, Nintendo Switch, and uh, Xbox Live, that a brick and mortar game store like Blockbuster can come in and rake in money from people that want to buy games that were made 20 years ago. So it's, it's an interesting model. It's an interesting thought because we're going to move away from that, but there's still a place for it. Uh, so we say things like Kylie Cosmetics as well, where someone who is an Instagram influencer just started a cosmetic site and then uses her influence on social media to sell overpriced cosmetics um, to cycle back into her own influence. And that regardless of how, oh, Jared, just come to Ottawa. They have like 20 of those. Um, look at Game Zetra. But I have a genuine copy of every Pokemon game ever made, so I <laughs> trust me. I um, I know what's up when finding those. Uh, I can even solder the new battery in for you if you want, so you can keep your save file. But anyway, back to e-commerce. Um, the uh, what Kylie Jenner is able to do is create a, a cycle of I have this. Um, uh, I have this influence by my makeup. Makeup is controversial, expensive, but it's still influencing. And then she can make more and more money. She's like one of the youngest billionaires in the world, I think. Okay, some more strategies. Um, acquiring and marketing. I want to go ahead. Gosh, yeah, right here. So, so we've discussed the business to consumer models and how we think strategically about uh, business to consumer e-commerce. This week we'll discuss product market fit, managing customer relationships, and data-driven marketing. So there's a few things you have to look at. Like, what are your value propositions? So what is the service that you are bringing to your, the service or the provision of goods to the user, and why is it that you're making it valuable? Like anyone, there are certain skills that anyone can have if they learn them, but why is it your ability to provide the service? Is it your ability to provide the commodity that makes it valuable? Can you do it cheaper? Can you do it quality? Um, anything like that. And customer segments, who are you relating to? What markets are you connecting with? Um, where does your money come from? What relationships do you have with your customers? So not only is there what customer segments do you have, but what relationship do you have with them? Because every, every company has a slightly different relationship with their consumer. Facebook, for example, has a very different relationship with, with you than say Dalhousie does but there's still a relationship and there's still a definable quality to that relationship. Is it a client, like technically speaking, university should be customer service oriented, but you never hear a professor say, 
you've paid to be here. You know, I'm going to give you good customer service. You just don't hear that. Uh, but with a company like Future uh, Future Shop or Best Buy, and uh, you go in and you make a complaint, they say, "Oh, you paid for it, so you know, I've got to give you good customer service." It's very different atmosphere and very different relationships. Like, it's unthinkable to go into the dean's office and say, "I'm not getting good customer service," but when I worked at the Hilton, people did that five times a day. Like, what medium are you using to connect with people? What activities are you are you running? Like, are you producing something? Are you provisioning something? Are you making something available? Are you dispatching service workers? What resources do you require to do this? Do you need server computers? Do you need people that have their own cars? Do you need professors? Do you need computer scientists? What do you need? Who are your partners? Because no business can exist in a vacuum on its own. And how are you how are you paying for all this? How are things laid out so that you can make money? And all of these together, or all these red ones, make the product market. So we see things like products and services, game for, um, actually, I don't want to do that one. So you have to think about who are your customers. So when you're making your e-commerce website, who's going to be using it? Um, what money are they going to spend? Why are they going to be spending it? Um, how do you profile your users? Think about who's going to be using your site and how you can market to them. Then how do you, now that you know who they are and who are going to be using it, how do you create value for them? So last semester, we had a group of students create a um, marketplace for pet rocks. And what they did was they were able to say like, um, we're doing pet rocks, but exclusively for rich people. So like everything costs like $10,000 and it's like diamond encrusted pet rocks. And they created the value proposition of like, you don't just go to a regular old store and buy like glitter and crafts, you buy like actual jewelry. And that's the value is that your pet rock can be worth $50,000. Um, so if you take a look at BlackBerry, who were the once dominant people in the um, smartphone area, what's happened to BlackBerry? They are gone, or they might still have a pulse, I'm not sure, but them and Sears are definitely hurtling, hurtling through the atmosphere. Um, BlackBerry was disrupted by the iPhone. BlackBerry used to be, I'm the business guy, I have a business phone, and then there was, I'm everybody else, I have a flip phone. An iPhone came in and said, hey, you can be everybody else and still have a networked phone. And that disrupted the BlackBerry game because once consumers merged to the iPhone environment, all the companies started developing apps that anyone can use on the iPhone. And that disrupted the need for development on BlackBerry and therefore people started moving to iPhone. And from there, iPhone just became more and more dominant, all because the consumer adopted it, and that made it more profitable to develop on the iPhone or on BlackBerry. Uh, and in addition to that, iPhone marketed way better than BlackBerry did, so even business people wanted iPhones. Um, like when I worked for Defense, they only used Blackberries, but there was one time some guy was like, am I powerful enough to request an iPhone? And I was like, no one is, but I, I feel you. So we see, I just talked about this. So customer relations, yeah. Uh, customer relations, can you think of product market fits for influential products? So we look at Apple, who does Apple connect with? Apple is not just for anybody. Um, I have friends that vehemently hate all Apple products because they consider them akin to Rolex and you know, like overly expensive and going to that market, which I think is true to some extent. However, as a computer scientist, I can appreciate the value of the Mac operating system, uh, mainly because I don't like Windows. And back in the day when Unix was split, um, one went to Linus Torvalds and he created Linux and that went a million different directions. And now we have thousands of open source uh, versions of Linux, or there is Unix got turned into Mac OS, which has had billions of dollars poured into it to make one version of quality by Apple. And then that version runs on the hardware that they designed to work concurrently with it. So for me as a computer scientist, I think that's valuable, but I can also appreciate the value of a, of a high end PC and I can also appreciate the value of a Raspberry Pi. So um, these are, there is product fit to these things. Um, but the important part is the e-commerce element of we have found a way to make 
technology, which was once boring and uh, not interesting to everyone, you know, it used to be back in the day that computer people were absurd enough on their own. We have found a way to pe make people identify with their personality to a computer. Like I use Macs because I, they work for me, but remember when the Mac ads came out and Mac was like, oh, I'm an easy going regular guy and this is PC and it was like a dude in a suit who was always having some problem. Like they found a way to attribute the brand to the person. And that's a huge element of electronic commerce is building those digital relationships so that people want to keep using your technology. So we look at the sales funnel strategy. So it costs a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of web traffic to get a client, but it costs even less to keep them and grow them. So when you call Bell and you're like, hey, I hate my cell phone plan, I want a better one, and they give it to you, that's because to them, the value proposition is that it's cheaper to keep you than it is to get a new client. Now, personally, in my opinion, every day, Bell, Rogers, Telus, Eastlink, probably all lose the same amount of people and somebody else picks them up. Uh, like there, there's always like a, every day there's a dance of people quitting one of those companies and picking up with the other, but it's more expensive to get a new one than it is to keep someone old. And these companies do know this and that's why they can funnel back and um, give you these options because it's now they have to spend money either to get a new customer to replace your revenue stream or keep you. So 10,000 website visitors, 1,000 activated users, 100 prospects, 10 paying customers, and then one enthusiastic customer goes back into the activated user pile to go through the process again. So for example, um, chess.com is this website that I have a very on again, off again relationship with. There are some days, I used to, when I tutored with these, this group of kids at Sylvan, there was about five of them that were really into chess and chess was their reward. And they always got me really excited about chess. So I used to pay for chess.com every month. And then all of a sudden I realized since I live here, I stopped playing. So I canceled it. But then every once in a while I want to go play a game and I reactivate my membership to get rid of ads. And then sometimes I'll play for like, I'll play like a hundred games in four days then I won't touch it for two months and realize I've paid for two months where I haven't used it. So I cancel it and we go on and on and on. Um, and that is the sales funnel we're talking about here. So of the people I know that use that site, most of them use the free version. Uh, they occasionally play, so they're activated users generating revenue and getting money from advertising. Then there's the prospects, which are the ones that are like, oh, if I play enough games, I will pay for it. Um, and these transfer back, back in through. So you are going to have these relationships with your users. Um, so we look at the sales funnel in terms of a tactic. Oops, was, why didn't that change anything? So we look at the percentages, right? 10% of website visitors become 10% activated users. So it's 10% that are gonna go through each time. And that's what is that. So we get better ads, better site design, better charts, great online reviews. So as Julia will tell you, user interface design is the key difference between getting people between the activated users who are browsing and the people who will actually purchase and use the site service. It doesn't matter how good your back end is if your front end sucks because users will never get between the better site design to the better, to the better carts. It just doesn't happen. And then they will leave and go somewhere else where they can flow through better. Um, click through activation and conversion ratios is the key to all electronic marketing. So electronic commerce marketing. So as soon as we know what click it takes to get people from funnel to funnel, then we know, or section to section, then we know where we have to direct them. We have to direct our user interfaces that way, our advertising that way. Um, and that is what gets them through. So that's why clicks are so huge. You can actually pay sites to, uh, install plugins on your sites and tell people and tell you exactly where people click, exactly where they spend their mouse spend most of the time, so that you know exactly how people are using your site so that you can optimize it to um, benefit this model. It is 255 um, or 355 in Halifax. So I'm going to leave it here. Um, I managed to get through almost a hundred slides, so I'm actually pretty proud of that. Um, does anyone have any questions before we go?
Okay, Julio. Does anyone Alex, have uh, mattress recommendations? If there's no questions. What are you talking about? Well, so I'm trying to buy a mattress, right? And I was thinking about this because your slides, they were like, you know, you can get better ads or yeah. there's like a higher step to that is buying websites to advertise, like just to be like a review site, but only give your product good reviews. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. So, I'm trying to get like legitimate reviews for mattresses because I don't trust anyone on the internet right now. Right, fair. And most of the ads on most of the reviews are fake. Yeah, it's um, it's messed up. Yeah, um I would say don't go with a waterbed unless you want comic clarity. Um, <laughs> uh, otherwise, um I've always wanted like one of those beds that you can like, like in the Simpsons where you can like have the remote, like bed goes up, bed goes down, bed goes up. Like a, <laughs> but other than that, I don't know what to tell you. Um, okay, now it looks like the conversation in the chat's actually hitting this. Break out of the cycle and buy yourself a roll-up pad for dirt cheap, saves you tons of square foot in an apartment. It'll help you sleep better since you only go to bed when you want to sleep. True. <laughs> I was cool, I was cool, thinking cool. like anything under like five grand would be nice. So I, I'm spending. Nice. That's gonna be a nice mattress. Cool. Anyone else have questions or anything like that? Uh, don't forget to do your SRIs if you haven't already. Try to get milestone one in as soon as possible. Um, let me know if there's any topics you want me to. Uh, cover. I will ask my friend on Bitcoin if he wants to do a course on it. Um, and yeah, other than that, have a great day, guys. I'll hang out for another minute or two. Oh, Shannon has a question. So, okay, uh, sure. Shannon, go ahead. I'm just going to talk if that's cool. Um, yeah, that's fine. I have a meeting with a TA, I don't know which TA, through the calendar thing at four o'clock, and I have no idea where that meeting is going to be. Which TA is it? I do not know. Um, Alex, oh, you it's, you it's not me. I don't think it's me. I'm assuming it's Sam. <laughs> like, Sam, that's the one. Okay, so it's Sam. Um, if it's four o'clock, it's probably through the Discord. I don't even have Discord. Excellent. Um, just send Sam an email and say, hey, I want to meet on yeah. what, whatever platform. He'll accommodate you. What is Sam's last name? So I can, I, I can find his email. Post. Okay. Sam.post at Dalbo.ca. Sam.post. Thank you. No problem. Uh, the question on participation, the participation for today is to do your SRI and let me know that you did it. All right, have a good day, guys.